<clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, Georgette Forney has been such a pillar and such a, a person of not only uh, strength but consistency. And I refer her to other women who are searching to do something for the cause of life. And so I just thank God for the relationship and her willingness to lay down her life freely for the society that has not had access to the American dream. So today, uh, first, I'm a Baptist preacher on the clock, so I have to move very quickly. <laughs> so I'm watching the clock, but uh, sharing something, is, it's a couple of times, I think, because for such a time as this, never before has the church been so desperately needed in this country, and never is there an organization, a movement that is so critical right now. And so I'm going to share this with you. Um, there's a certain flow to this, and, and it's really an experience I had that, I, that is basically corporate. There's personal experiences. Uh, there's experiences to be shared with three, uh, with 12, uh, and then with the masses. Well, this one's for the masses, and I think we have to understand the critical call that God has on our lives right now. And so, uh, now if I click it where? Here? Or here? Okay. So this is, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, just say to yourself, what's on your mind? What's on your mind? Now say it a little loud. <laughs> I told you Baptist. I forgot. <laughs> Say to your neighbor, what's on your mind? What's on your mind? Now, now personal testimony. When I was about five or six years of age, I was playing with my Tom girl, the tomboy sister, and we were running back and forth, running back and forth, running back and forth, playing tag. Remember, kids don't even play tag today and things like that. Then she had stopped playing hopscotch to come over to play tag. And I ran past a oil tank, you know, the cap. And my dad always used to say, don't go near there, don't touch there, don't play with that, don't open that. So I'm only around six years of age, uh, maybe even five. And of course, whatever you're told not to do, you have a tendency to do. And I ran by the cap and I looked down and I noticed a small person that was in distress a very, very small child that was in distress. I'm six years of age. This is in the 50s. And so I look down, of course, what would you do? I take off running to get my big sister. And I ask my sister, come back and look at this. And we came back within a minute, a minute or so. She was right around the side of the house, snatched her back, and of course it's gone. And we're searching all over. I said, well, it couldn't have gone anywhere. It was, it was in distress. It was, there was something wrong. And we looked all around. They said, well, she said, it's probably a squirrel. It was probably a baby chick that fell. Well, I said, I've seen a baby chick. I've seen all those things. I said, this was a person. OK, so we forget about it. I run to tell my mom and dad when they get home, they're looking at me strangely. And it's a part of my life at that time that just passes. And so years pass, decades pass. I don't even think about this. And so it's around 1998, 99, somewhere around in there. I'm involved now in the pro-life movement. And I'm in St. Louis at the largest cathedral in St. Louis, a great uh, bishop there. And we're sitting there. I'm sitting alongside my wife, and she says they're passing down these little models. And I said, models of what? She said, you'll see. Now, she doesn't even know this. I've never even told it to her. But when the model passed down, I looked. It was those small children's models of a child in utero, a child in the womb in its first few weeks of life. And I looked down. And I just lost it. 
Because it's immediately as I look down, God took me back to that time when I was five or six years old. And he said to me, whispered to me, he said, what was this by? I said, it was by the oil tank. He said, you are anointed to stop this. And that's what the oil meant. That's what you saw. And your life is anointed to stop this. And so I'm beside myself. <laughs> no one knows why I'm emotional. It was a fun day. But that experience happened to me to let me always be focused on what my mission would be. Despite being a Baptist preacher and a pastor, I have other obligations. But this was to be a priority. And so the call in my life basically was always important. And this is all going so weird. Just stay where you got to stand this. <laughs> the call in my life was very important to me. And so when I joined the church and... And by the way, Fulton Sheen had the biggest impact on me. I read his book one time. People understand, sometimes I don't know what I am, but I am a Christian. <laughs> and um, I, I grew up with Mary and Jesus in my, in my room. You know, Mary here, Jesus there. Um, and grew up. So I always had this mind to want to know God. And so my pastor says to me, he says, you got to know God, you know. And I said, well, I, you know, I accepted him as my savior and he said, you got to know who you are. And so I'm reading and, and praying and said, Lord, well, well, show me who I am. Well, that came to the first chapter of Jeremiah. He said, before you were in your mother's womb, he said, I knew you, and I ordained you, and I sanctified you, and I called you to be a prophet to the country. I said, well, in the Baptist church, there's no prophets in all these other places. I never heard the term used. And I asked my pastor about it. He said, well, you're supposed to speak on the behalf of God, which is what the word means. And so not even thinking of my earlier experience, I dedicated myself to be able to share his message with everyone. And now it seems like indeed, unquestionably, I used to read that first chapter and the book of Jeremiah. I love the book. It's a great book. It's a book certainly that has been very much a part of my life. I made a commitment back in the 80s to read the Bible once every year. And so I've read this, the book of Jeremiah multiple times. But how many people know God can hide things from you? It's scary. It's scary, really scary how he can hide things from you. And so I said to myself, when this revelation seemingly or just an illumination of what was always there, it was stunning to me because I'm a pro-life preacher. I preach messages to wake people up on the issues of life. So say it again. What's on your mind? What's on your mind? I'm, I'm setting you up if you didn't know that. Just, just stay there. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Philippians, that should be Philippians 2.5. The scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? And we're encouraged to have a renewing, a refreshing, and getting the right information. My people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge, meaning we have to get the knowledge and the mind of God in our hearts and in our spirits. Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, I will not know what the will, purpose, and the heart, and the consciousness of God with the present mind that I did have because it's from a fallen world. And so I'm now in communion with God, and he's dealing with my mind to change my perspectives and how I view subject matters and view things. Hebrews 10. This is a covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds. Will I write them? The relationship we all know, the revelation of his truth is a blessing to us. We study 
to show that we've already been approved by God, whom he did foreknow, he did predestine. He loves us from the beginning. But the key thing there I want you to see is I will put, these are my laws, into their hearts and minds. Hearts and minds, I am putting my law. So revelation does not come from the bottom up. It comes from the top down. So I'm getting this from God. You are getting a renewing of your mind from God. This is not of myself. And so it's coming from the Father. Stay with me. Now, I'm going to stop right there. In 1999, a good friend of mine, we all went on the Say So March, and it's a march to bring to the attention at that time the 1,452 African-American children that are killed each day by abortion. 52% of all African-American pregnancies end in abortion. African-Americans make up 12.8 of the population, but now 29% of all abortions. So the term black genocide is not hyperbole or a radical rant from a right-wing reverend. It's a sociological fact. And I say that to say, my friend, good friend, Damon Owens, he stood up during the march and said this, abortion should not only be legal, should not be legal, it should be unconscionable. In other words, it should not be anything that would ever even come into your mind. Before I go to this, one more example. When I got my first job, I worked for a hard taskmaster. I had a pharaoh, trust me. And he was about the money. And he, you had to cross your I's and dot, uh, was it cross your T's and dot your I's. Now that used to be a term we used to use but totally, when you're writing invoices before computers, when you're writing invoices, your handwriting has to be near perfect and for the drivers and everyone else to read. He came in one morning and he said, he used to call me Cleo. He said, Cleo, I want to see you tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the morning. So I looked at him. I said, yes, sir. I'll see you at 7 o'clock. Around lunchtime, he came down the stairs and said, Cleo, I want to see you at 7 o'clock tomorrow I looked at him and said, no problem, I got it, <laughs> 7 o'clock tomorrow. He says it a third time before I'm going out the door. Cleo, I want to see you at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. I said, no problem. He said it three times. Three. And so I'm there at 6.30 <laughs> to make sure I'm there at 7 for that meeting. He said it three times. Three as you theologians know, is a number of affirmation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, the first, the last, and the all. You know, all those threes are spoken to us to affirm a truth. And so he said it to me three times so there'd be no question. I didn't leave there saying, I wonder if he wants me to come tomorrow morning. <laughs> I understood clearly because it was said to me, Three times by one person in one setting. First time, Jeremiah 7, 31, 32. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to pollute it. First of all, these were God's people. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is the valley of the son of Himan to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart. I never said do that. And it's never even come into my heart. Now you have to understand what God is saying here. The conclusion of this, you'll see clearly you have a mandate to share, and you must be very clear when you share it. Because he's saying here to think that a parent's 
would ever kill their child never even came in to my mind or to my heart. God says, you, you know, the omniscient God who knows everything, who knows every equation, every fact, every historical point, there's nothing you can ever tell him, but he has this unique characteristic. He is God, and he can do anything. And this is what he's chosen to do. We know in Isaiah 43 in Hebrews, one of the, I think it's the 10th chapter somewhere, he says, I remember your sins no more. So when you come crying over something you did last week, you asked for forgiveness for, it doesn't even register with him. <laughs> God says, I've chosen not to remember your sin. In other words, I do not put that in my mind. I do not allow your past sins to register in my mind. And I thought that was the only thing until just a few months ago when he brought to my attention something he had hid from me for all these years. Oh, there's something else I don't allow to come into my mind. The fact that parents or parent would choose to slaughter, to kill their child. I don't even allow that to come in my mind. That is so abominable to me. It's such an abomination. I don't allow the thought. Jeremiah 19, 4 and 5, second time. Same prophet, same setting. Because they were forsaken me, they have estranged this place, and they have burned incense. And each time he's talking to God's people, by the way, incense unto other gods, whom neither they have, their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah. They have filled this place with the blood of innocents. He says it again. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not nor spake it, neither came in to my mind. Adultery, we can talk about. Fornication, we can talk about. Homosexuality, lesbianism, we can talk about that. God says, I can tell you, that's in my head. But that, the fact that a parent would kill their children does not even come into my mind. Second time, now third. But they set their abominations in their house and called it by my name to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal and they were in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not. I never said do anything like that. Neither came into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. He said that never. What are you doing? This is not even in my conscience, God says. This is so appalling, so abominable to me. And to think there are denominations and clergy who endorse this and say, <laughs> it's sacred? Are you mad? How, how disturbing that must be to God to see someone who represents him tell him he would condone something of this sort. God says, this, I don't even let it come in my thinking. And we practice this at the rate of almost 60 million now at this point. The, I got to speed this up. The biblical word for heart is the inner aspect of a man and all these three parts all together and with the primary. Basically, the mental process, the emotions, the will. Why did God say mind and heart? He knows they're interchangeable. He knows how we think. We know we're come sometimes intellectual. We very likely, sometimes women do it better. They are able to answer emotionally and intellectually and be reasonable other than men do, basically. 
But he's saying this, there's not a part of my waking conscience. There's not one part of me in my thinking, in my emotions, that would ever, ever, ever consider parents killing those who are made in my own image. Does it register? You ever try to put information to a computer when it's kicked it out? You can't put it in because it's no longer in the hard drive. God said, that thought, the thought that parents would kill a child is not in the hard drive. It will not respond. Don't even, I, I, there's no discussion on this. It is an abomination to me. And when my people are condoning it, oh my Lord. Anyone you know who would even be on the fence, you need to tell them, that's not in God's mind. Why is it in yours? If God does not allow it in your mind, why do you have it in yours? Why should you support political candidates who do, I don't want to be political, but I have to say, support political candidates who do thus condoning? You can't condone a platform that God says is so, something is so abominable to him, he doesn't even let it come in his brain, his thinking, his consciousness. The great uh, omnipotent, all-powerful God says that is so despicable. Don't touch me with that. Don't, that's not even in my mind. Has no business in a part of society. What will you say to God about your allegiance with what he would not allow himself to even think about? How can you be aligned to something that God doesn't even allow to be any way a part of him? And then call ourselves the church. That is, as an oxymoron, as the antithesis of who God is. And so you, when you're talking with people and sharing, you can start off and say, what's on your mind? What's in your mind? Because this is something God does not permit in his. God bless you.